99 Sleepy Hollow Review and Thoughts film. Happy Halloween! And happy Spooktober, at least if I finish uploading this on the day I record it, which is the last day of October. So they just dropped the second teaser for Halloween Kills. It looks great. I'm really excited for that movie. If you live in America, please make sure that you vote in this extremely important election. And starting with the review. So, yes, as a quick... I'm I'm aware that a lot of people have already watched this movie, maybe most people who would ever watch it. I am going to do this review as if the listener hasn't watched the movie. The year is 1799, and a series of beheadings is taking place in Sleepy Hollow, a hamlet near New York. So Ichabod Crane here, a an investigator rather than a school teacher is sent to Sleepy Hollow to, to, yeah, get to the bottom of it. The script does a very good job of, there, there's a lot of little details that you, you probably won't figure out what's, what exactly is going on on the very first viewing, but there are the little hints, so it doesn't feel like it comes completely out of nowhere once you know, you get to more reveals and such. Now, the script is more interested in the... I suppose, really, the movie in general is more interested in the the murder mystery going on, the atmosphere, the the violence and gore, than character relationships and such, and the relationships, maybe perhaps, may, maybe especially close relationships, loving relationships in the movie, don't really feel as strong, with, with perhaps one or two exceptions, as they could, and ultimately the movie is at least a little poorer for it. As an adaptation, it is very loose, and... I think you're probably going to be frustrated if you go into this movie thinking that it is really going to follow the, the original all that much. The, the characters are there, and there are some major events, but by and large, it's really not, it's not trying to be a close adaptation. It is still a ghost story, and... If, you know, there is a clear fascination with the, the time period. Now, the characters, again, are largely, you know, they're, they're not as much of the draw as the, yeah, atmosphere and such. But there are some, some interesting details in there. And the acting, this has Johnny Depp at you know, he he doesn't get much quirkier than he is in this movie. And that is, you know, if, if that is something that bothers you, you are going to hate this movie because he is, yeah. The, there's, a, there's a lot of quirks there. And others, you know, a lot of the acting is, it, it doesn't necessarily come across as the most natural. It, it feels... You know, the, the movie is, it's not quite parody, but it is pastiche, of, among other things, Hammer Horror. And I have only seen clips of Hammer Horror movies. I don't think I've ever seen an entire Hammer Horror movie. But the acting in those movies, yeah, not, not the best. The cinematography is gorgeous. And just, yeah, the, the, there are some incredible shots in, in this movie. The editing is quite strong. The, you know, it, it will, the, the, while, while it will linger on longer shots in some of the, you know, such as establishing shots, shots and such, when it comes to the action, it is cut very, 
very swiftly, you know. Now, as far as genre goes, the movie is, you know, it, it, I was not able to rewatch the Nostalgia Chick review of this movie, but I recall that she pointed out that it's too gory for people, for, for some people, but those coming for the gore might find it too campy and such, and yeah, you, you gotta watch it as a, as a, as a pastiche and tribute to Hammer Horror, otherwise there, some of the aspects that Tim Burton was trying to emulate from those movies are probably going to bother you. Now, as far as, you know, in a number of ways, this is a lot like Tim Burton's other movies. It is, it is peak Tim Burton, for sure. And, yeah, if you find his... Let's go with tropes. To be frustrating, you're going to hate the movie. I've, I've read... In preparing for this video, I read positive and negative reviews. And a lot of the negative reviews, I'm not saying all, but a lot of them say that they're really frustrated with how Tim Burton does things, you know, and yeah, that is if for sure if if you if you are not won over on whether or not Tim Burton is a masterful director, I you know, it's been a while since I watched very much of his, but I do still love at least some of his movies. If you haven't already been won over by Tim Burton, this movie is not going to win you over. There's there are too many Burton traits and tropes that are just not. He's 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 an acquired taste. He's incredibly talented. I don't think anybody disputes that, but he's definitely an acquired taste. And the tone is a bit it's not always really like silly and it's not always gory. But it gets both very silly at times and very gory. Occasionally it is both at the same time. But yeah, for sure, tone is where a lot of people are going to find this to be completely just... They're, they're going to lose interest in it. Now, I would say the, the best aspect is the, the atmosphere and the, the just... You know, Tim Burton said of this that it was the first time he directed a horror movie, which is weird because those are the kinds of movies he likes the most. And you can really tell. the the I, I forget if this was the first R-rated. I think he might have made other R-rated movies before this. But I believe this... Keeping in mind I have not watched all of his oeuvre, I believe this was the most violent movie he had made by this time and you can really tell that this is not just like gore to like you know in a lot of horror movies from the 90s and onwards you've got like they're trying to do this for you know to attract teenage viewers who in the minds of studio executives just want a lot of violence and gore you can tell that this tim burton is having fun with this he is relishing the opportunity to do something more gory and violent than he really had earlier. And just the the enthusiasm of Tim Burton and of these incredibly talented people, like the people doing the practical effects, just tremendous work. And the 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 set design, it's 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 absolutely incredible craft. And, yeah, the, the enthusiasm of all of these people that, that, you know, got up early in the morning, worked hard all day, but loved being able to make this kind of movie, just really, you know, the, the, there's, there's so much passion in this. Now, as for the worst aspect, ultimately it is very much, it's the kind of film... It's the kind of film that is going to divide audiences, and 
not every movie Tim Burton makes is like that. He's made ones that are much more family friendly than this, whilst still having some mature ideas. Like, I would say a movie like Edward Scissorhands, keeping in mind that it's been some years since I watched it last, I think there's something for almost every generation. Like, there, there are things that, you know, there are things that a child would, would love seeing, and at the same time, I don't think it's quite so, I don't know. You know what, just to be on the safe side, I'm going to say, I don't know that I would show that movie to someone who wasn't at least like 13 or, or you know, but, you know, you could show it to a 13-year-old, a 30-year-old, a 50-year-old, and they would find something to enjoy in the movie, whereas this, this movie is a very, it has a very narrow appeal, ultimately. And... I would say that, you know, if you watch this and you really enjoy it, you know, definitely watch some of Burton's other work. I'm not claiming that everything he's made is worth watching, but, you know, there are... I'm, I'm not going to, to list them here. Once again, it's been some years since I watched them, but there's almost definitely people you could ask for recommendations on other Tim Burton movies. And, yeah, so who to recommend it to? That is a difficult one. If you love Hammer Horror, I think you'll probably enjoy this. And otherwise, I don't know. I mean, I'll be honest, I loved it right from the start. But I don't mind movies that are a bit... That, that have a bit of a narrow appeal. It just, it's such a strong horror story that just, you know, for some it doesn't completely work because of some of the, you know, some of the sillier stuff and such, but yeah, you know, yeah, if, if you love Hammer Horror and or if you love pastiche, you know, I think it is very important to watch this with that in mind, you know, I, I, you know, it's, it's difficult because some pastiche you can recommend to anyone. Like, I could see there, there might be people who've watched Hot Fuzz and not realized that it's, you know, it is meant to be. You know, it is a pastiche of these action movies. It's not, quote-unquote, just one of these action movies. It is also a pastiche. And, yeah, I, th I think you could watch that. Hot Fuzz could be the first action movie you ever watch, and you could still really enjoy it. But if this is the first horror movie you watch, I, I could completely see just really finding it to be, you know... Or the first Tim Burton movie, so... But, but yeah, if you love pastiche, and or you love Hammer Horror, and or want a pastiche of Hammer Horror, then I recommend it, too. And I would personally give this a strong, solid 8 decapitations out of 10. And that does, in fact, bring us to the spoiler section. There are going to be spoilers throughout the rest of this video. So if you have not went, watched the movie yet, this... Yeah. Disclaimers. If you don't care about these disclaimers, I try to keep them short and relevant, but your mileage may vary. You can skip right ahead to the section of your choice in the description box. I often try to talk very fast during the disclaimers, since a lot of it is very standard information. I'm not going to keep speaking as fast as I sometimes do during this section once I get into the, you know, the, the other sections of the video. I realize that this video is long. I'm going to try to do what I can to make it worth your time. And so, yeah, so the rest of the video contains spoilers. And this includes for the original story, although the movie 
yeah, if you know spoilers for, for both, you already know this does not follow the original all that closely. And... I am only spoiling this and, you know, the original story and possibly other adaptations. I haven't watched, yeah, really. The I've watched this and I've watched the other movie that came out in 1999. I think that one was called The Legend of Sleepy Hollow, Hollow sorry, which I think is, isn't that also the title of the original? I, I think this, this being called Sleepy Hollow was perhaps a hint that it wasn't just going to adapt the original. Now, I I don't intend to spoil other work by the people making this movie. I might bring up their other work if I find it relevant, but either I won't spoil them or I'll warn right before I do it and hold up an index finger so you can mute and skip ahead until you see me lower the index finger. So... Yeah. I barely remember The Legend of Sleepy Hollow, also from 1999. I just remember I didn't think it was a particularly compelling, like, I knew that it wasn't going to be like this one, you know, but yeah, it's just, like, I guess if you are already, I mean, I, I'm aware that some people grew up with this story, and I, then I can understand being okay with a less, but it's just, it's, not all that compelling. I don't know if it was made. I, I'm not aware of if they were trying, if they were working on that before they knew Tim Burton was making a loose adaptation or if they, I'm, I'm not going to, you know, I don't know if that was made to try to get more attention once a Tim Burton version was over, also, you know, in, in theaters. I don't know. So I can't speak to that. Anyway, I am not familiar with the other, you know, versions, and, you know, I, I, I might say something that sounds ridiculous based on what you might know of the original story or other adaptations or something. In that case, it's simply because I'm not familiar. I mean, I'm, I, I basically, I have listened to, you know, on, on Wikipedia there is a free legal reading of the, the story, and yeah, I, I have listened through that. I totally get why people get into the story. It's it's honestly, I, I seriously thought that I would listen to just a little bit at a time. I ended up listening to the whole, through the whole thing in a very short space of time, and it's I want to say 83 minutes long. I don't usually sit down and listen to audiobooks for that long in in such a short space of time. But yeah, I think I ended up listening through the whole thing in one day. And that's, yeah, if you know me, I do not usually sit down and just listen to stuff for that long. That's, that's very unusual for me. So anyway. Content warning and or trigger warning. I'm sorry, I have a hard time understanding the distinction, but I do really respect how necessary the terms are. I don't want to cover my bases. I am going to be discussing the potentially, potentially triggering content of this movie, including child murder, gore, and methods of torture. And, let's see. Yeah, so... Yes, I don't have a problem with violence and gore in general. The thing is one of my favorite horror movies and movies in general. I also love Cronenberg's The Fly, Video Drone, etc. And I also don't have a problem with film sexuality, nudity, disturbing, and upsetting material in general. Monster is one of my favorite movies. And I might swear in this video for those bothered by such. I suppose. There, in the movie itself, there is very little swearing. They they say things like hell and damn, but they don't really use them. Like, when, when one of them says the word hell, they are referring to hell. They're not just saying hell gratuitously. Instead of me quoting all the lines I love from this movie, let me just say I loved every line they put in the IMDb memo quote section 
so you can just look that up instead of me sitting here quoting all of them. Now, yeah, so the following is a short list supplied by the IMDb More Like This list of movies that are similar to this, and I'm going to say what rating I gave for them if, if I watched them and let you know if I did not watch them. So, Edward Scissorhands, which I gave a, an 8 out of 10, Sweeney Todd, Tim Burton's version, which I gave a perfect 10. Dark Shadows, which I originally gave a 7 out of 10. Honestly, today I'd probably give it a 6 out of 10. And, sorry, once again, Burton's version. Beetlejuice, 8 out of 10. Mars Attacks, originally I gave that a 7 out of 10. Today I'd probably give it an 8 out of 10. From Hell, 8 out of 10. Secret Window, 7 out of 10. I have not watched Ed Wood. Bram Stoker's Dracula, the Gary Oldman version, which I gave a 7 out of 10. I think today I might... It's been many years, so do not hold me to that, but that's based on the first viewing. Batman Returns, 7 out of 10. Gremlins, 6 out of 10. And it was also compared to Big Fish. I have not watched that movie. Now, let's see. Yeah, and at this point in the video, I try to compare this to movies that it's similar to. I mean, I've already mentioned I do. I haven't watched Hammer Horror. I haven't stayed away from it. It just hasn't, you know, I used to watch horror movies on TV all the time, and they just did not show Hammer Horror. They've, they've shown horror movies from a lot of other times and subgenres, so I, I don't really know why. I guess if I had to compare it to something, in some ways it is somewhat like a slasher movie, in which case, like, as far as, you know, whenever the talk comes to slasher movies, my personal favorite of the overall, I, I really... It is supposed. It is perhaps more of a proto slasher, but Halloween, the original from 1978, is always going to. But yeah, if we're talking gorier, Halloween 2018, I quite love. And let's see, there is, yeah, A Nightmare on Elm Street, especially movies two, three, and four. And I. Yes, that is more or less it. And yeah, I would say that this this ranks pretty high up. And in some ways, I like this more than the other ones I watched. Now, in my videos, I try to both talk specifically about the subject and also the issues that it brings up, and I try to have a good balance between the two, rather than letting one of them overwhelm the other. And, you know, I realize not everybody wants both of these. Now, I record this as soon as I can get to the computer after watching the movie. And, let's see. Yeah, so, you know, from here on out, this video is not a review. It's a series of, well, thoughts. Some of it is analysis, some of it is MST3K riff tracks and other jokes. And let's see. yeah, so the time codes for all the sections are in the description box. The first section is thoughts that I had while watching in chronological order. You can think of it as a running commentary or live tweeting or the like. The second section is thoughts that I had before watching. And in the final section, I get into stuff I think is worthwhile to get into on Rotten Tomatoes, Metacritic, MDB, and Wikipedia. Right, so at this point I try to get into whether I think the movie has empathy for the least likable characters. I mean, ultimately, it has some empathy. 
probably the the least hmm probably the the least likable ones are the archer sisters or twin I'm going to go with sisters because that I'm certain they are they're, I know I realize they're played by the same actress, but I'm not 100% certain that they are supposed to also be twins. In the, but the yeah, and it does have some because by the end of the movie we do realize you know as creepy as the witch is, you know the the I mean it's Tim Burton he's he does tend to have some sympathy for the you know, the, the outcasts, and, yeah, you know, by, by the end, you realize they, they do have good reason to, you know, I want to say her, was it that her name was Mary, I'm sorry, I'm going to go with Lady Van Tassel, just to be sure that I'm not using the wrong name, because that for sure she is, Lady Van Tassel, is, you know, the fact that she had to live under such, you know, such bad circumstances, you know, you understand why she wants revenge and why she wants to be ensured that she will get to keep the, the money that she married into. And, you know, the, the witch in the, yeah. Out, out in the in the, in the woods. Yeah, you know she's she's creepy and scary at first. Sorry to get yeah to get back to her. You know yeah later you do realize well you know yeah she's she's kind of creepy and scary but she's been living on her own for quite some time now, and it is like you know what what would you be like if you had been living completely by yourself. You know, th this is a place where almost no one even travels to. I mean, it actually, yeah, sorry. Other than, before Ichabod rode out there, no one else had been there. You know, the only people who went there were the Archer sisters. You know, and Lady Van Tassel hadn't been there for quite some time. So, yeah, you know, ultimately, but... But the, the, you know, the fact that the movie ends with Lady Van Tassel being taken to hell, and I'm not sure how much I'm going to discuss whether, you know, whether that is a just end for her character or not, but... Yeah, you know, they're obviously the the level of empathy runs into a boundary there, but yeah, ultimately it it does and I mean for a while it seems like Brom is just going to be a, a jerk throughout where I mean he basically sacrifices himself because he is desperate to stop the headless horseman even if it kills him. And it does, you know, he doesn't, yeah, I, I appreciate that they gave him that, you know, listening to the, the short story, sorry, yeah, I guess it is a short story, isn't it? I mean, I, yeah, it's not a novel, so it must be a short story. He sounds a lot more appealing there than they made him here, but then, you know, in this, at the end of the day, we are supposed to side with Ichabod, we're not supposed to be too torn up about Brom in this, but I do quite appreciate that. I, you know, if you if you know the short story and then you go into this movie, you probably don't expect Brom to die. I don't know by the halfway point maybe, and for Ichabod to stay in Sleepy Hollow until the whole thing with the headless horseman has been resolved. You know, I guess I should just briefly say for, for others who haven't read the short story, like I hadn't, in the short story, you know, basically the short story ends with the scene where Brom, you know, we don't know immediately that it's Brom, but a, a, a peer, what appears to be a headless horseman rides near 
Ichabod and throws a flaming pumpkin at his head. And, you know, in the original short story, that's the last Sleepy Hollow sees of Ichabod. And if I recall, there's even, like, you know, some say that he was killed or he died of fear or something, but some just say that he went back to New York. And the short story very heavily implies, I don't think it outright states it, that Brom was the, you know, in the original story, there isn't, there isn't a clear sign that the Headless Horseman exists. It's basically, it is a ghost story. You know, and I appreciate that they, they tell that story, like, yeah, it was legitimately creepy to listen to, you know, even knowing that it wasn't going, I, yeah, literally, when, excuse me, when I started watching it, I didn't know if the, ah, sorry, wires crossed or train, thought train jumped off the tracks briefly, I already knew that the original story doesn't really have a for sure, you know, it has the appearance of a headless horseman, but it very, it's strongly implied that that's not, it's just Brom, you know, he, he dressed up as a headless horseman to scare away Ichabod, and in the short story it worked, in the movie it doesn't. And... I still felt like this is this is legitimately a scary story, even though I knew there is no ghost in this story, you know. And there's certainly, I'm almost certain the, the short story doesn't... <laughs> nah, never mind. I'm not putting my head on the block for that one, as it were. The, the, actually, it is kind of interesting that in this movie it actually does... Like the the basically Ichabod hears them laughing at him, so he realizes, which is probably why he doesn't leave. You know, in the original, that's not you know he did not realize that he was just being that that it was a, it's essentially a prank. You know, it's it's a bit of a morbid prank, but it's a prank. He doesn't actually hurt Ichabod. It's not assault. The which sadly, when when two men want the same woman, and one of those men is this you know big muscular guy, a lot of the time it does involve assault. But yeah, you know, in the movie, basically Ichabod realizes that they you know. It was just a prank. Now, let's see. Yeah, so, I love horror movies, but it does tend to treat women kind of badly. And, you know, among other things, there are these misogynist tropes. And sadly, this movie does fall into, you know, Lady Van Tassel is the, the kind of, you know, she's this seductive, you know, it's, it's the, a lot of men can't handle when a woman has ambition, and so a lot of stories are told where women having ambition is seen as a bad thing. So, you know, Lady Van Tassel kills people and has, you know, has sex specifically so that she can become rich in, in the long term. You know, she wants to end up inheriting all the wealth. And, yeah, that is, you know, I, I appreciate that at least it does have these, you know, the, the, Once you realize what her background was like, you have a better excuse me, understanding of why she does it. And I realized that we only find out her background when, as we're finding out that she was the one who did it. What I'm saying 
up until that point, all we knew was that someone was killing, you know. I mean, the idea that it's a human being controlling the Headless Horseman comes up fairly early in the movie. So, you know, at, at that point, you know, obviously we think what kind of person would murder or would have someone murder for them. And, yeah, you know, sadly, the one of the things that will sometimes happen to, to women in horror movies is that they will be sexually assaulted without the film exploring the effects of it. Which is, you know, I'm, I'm not saying that you can't depict sexual assault in a movie, but you have to explore the effects of it. And here, which is also something I've, I believe Nostalgia Chick pointed out, it's almost as though we're supposed to feel like she deserves it because of the people she got the, the Headless Horseman to kill. And it's just, it's really, really gross to suggest that any woman ever deserves to be sexually assaulted for, for any reason at, at all. I, I can understand the idea that she deserves to die since she killed others, but there's there's no way no one deserves sexual assault. It's really that simple. But by and large, the movie does the the depiction of Katrina is positive, although for a while she's a red herring. But she does do what she can to help and. Yeah, really, if not for her, the, you know, if she hadn't been helping Ichabod, and she's the one who gives him the book that stops the bullet, the, you know, things would not have gone well. But, but yeah, really, if not for, for Katrina, Lady Van Tassel would have been successful, because Ichabod would not have been able to stop, you know, even if, if absolutely nothing else, then he would have been shot. If if Masbeth and Ichabod were alone with Lady Van Tassel in the woods when she shoots Ichabod, then, you know, Ichabod would have been killed by the bullet. And, yeah, you know, then the, the you know, she wouldn't have any problem stopping Masbeth or getting the horsemen to do so. Since the only, I, I do appreciate that, that Masbeth gets to be really important. He does manage to stop. Actually, he straight up knocks her out, doesn't he? Yeah, because she, she wakes up after the Headless Horseman's face has grown back on once he gets the skull back. Now, the this movie is in a, since, yeah, when you make a horror, story, it is important not to overexpose the threat, and yeah, this movie does a really good job of that. The uh, You never become completely accustomed to seeing the Headless Horseman, despite how much, I mean, he cuts off a lot of heads in this movie, so it would, like, it takes a deft hand to prevent us from getting completely used to him. You know, a deft hand and no head. So, so yeah, they, they do a really good job of that. It, it does a good job at suspense. Now, let's see. Yes, so I, I got this movie on sale. So anything negative is in this video is not a bitterness. I also do not feel like the movie wasted my time. Nobody forced me to watch it or to make this video. It's not that I'm upset at how this compares to what it's adapting, and not just because I have no prior history with it. I think it's too interesting to just discard the movie. I, I, I think it's good to have close adaptations of source material, especially such strong source material as this. But I don't think it's necessary when what you come up with is this interesting. And at the end, I mean, at the end of the day, this is still a ghost. It's it's still a scary story to to tell, 
you know, the, the, there are a lot of details that are different between the, the different ones, but yeah, the, the, you really do have a lot of things that it, it is still a scary story that you might retell someone and I mean, let's hypothetically say that the movie was not scary at all. It was a comedy that, you know, the, I think the black comedy in the movie works really well, but if it was nothing but comedy, if it was never scary, then I think it would be, like, at that point, then, then maybe, you know, alter the title to make it completely clear, like, I don't know, uh, all the laughs we had in Sleepy Hollow, or you know, going topless in Sleepy Hollow, some, something that makes it clear that it's not to be taken seriously. But if you just hear the words Sleepy Hollow, you don't assume that it's going to be funny. You do assume that it's going to be scary. Now, right, so I am, yeah. Let's see. Um, yes. If I say, you know, I'm not sure I'm going to say very many negative things in this, but any that I do. It's not that I'm upset at how this compares to other movies like it. You know, I mentioned in the review that it is, you know, not all of Tim Burton's movies are quite this unusual. You know, I think it's one of his best. I, I It's one of my personal favorites also. Those two are not always, don't always follow each other. And, yeah, I don't have some personal vendetta against anyone who worked on making it. To the best of my ability, the negative things I said in this video are fair criticism based on budgets, when it came out, what it, excuse me, what it was trying to achieve, etc. I first watched this in the year 2010, and I've watched it somewhere between 6 and 12 times since before now watching it today right before now doing this video. Now, let's see. My making jokes in this should not necessarily be taken as me thinking the thing I'm joking about is actually bad, me wanting to make light of the subject, etc. I simply find it very difficult not to MST3K and overanalyze everything I watch and play. Now, let's see. That is... Yes. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> <clears throat> I do, I swear, I try to clear my throat to get rid of, so, so that I don't have to do it, I try to clear my throat before I start recording, so that I don't have to do it during, but sometimes, anyway. Notes taken while watching. So, let's see. Right, the, yeah, the rating, I, yeah. You know, eight ridiculous. I give this eight ridiculous decapitations out of ten. Both, you know, if I were a film critic, that's what I would give it, and it is also my personal rating. And just to briefly, you know, R.I.P. to those who died after they helped make this movie. The opening sets the tone really well with the music. I quite like that the first few drops of red that we see, you know, we automatically assume that must be blood. It turns out to be that seal. I love that we don't see the Headless Horseman right away. At first, we just hear the ominous sounds from inside the carriage. You know, like, you hear the, the aggressive riding of another horse. Like, you... Somehow, I don't know, I don't know enough about audio editing, somehow they managed to make it, and it's not, I don't have like a surround system or something, somehow they managed to make it appear as though, or, or make it clear that this is not just, it's not just that the horses, you know, right, that pull the carriage, I guess is the word. It's not that they're just running faster and more aggressively. No, that's a different horse. There's a there's we can hear we we're seeing what he's seeing and hearing what he's hearing inside the carriage. And there's clearly we can hear 
there's another horse out there and it is riding very aggressively and just immediately we get like ah there's there's something you know what we saw even if it hadn't been filmed the way it was filmed we get the sense that this is something some people want to keep secret so the moment that an aggressive riding horse is heard we're like oh someone does not want for this you know someone wants to contain this information it must be really scary to suddenly realize that the rider of the carriage that you're in is dead like it sounds like part of an urban legend you know very convincing that first decapitation they must have like filmed it twice once with the actor and once with the effect head and then digitally blended them because clearly the man moves his face and then the head comes off in the same shot without a very clear cut between the yeah and we immediately see how old-fashioned the New York police is in wait did I write wait is this seven no it's 1799 sorry I accidentally wrote 1899 I'm pretty sure the story is set in 1890 1799 and the original story was set in 1790 or something like that each one found the head lopped off very clever phrasing he doesn't technically say that they found the heads as well we just assume that so it's not like he was lying once we find out the heads were not found at all you know they were found with the heads lopped off that doesn't mean they also found the heads that means they found the bodies without heads so yeah eight minutes and 40 seconds in we get the first look at Ichabod's hands with all the little needle you know holes in or sorry hands do we at that we maybe at that time only see one of the hands you know we don't know what it is we won't know the reason for a while I have to admit I had forgotten how little and how I guess I didn't really forget how brief the dream sequence or yeah let's go with dream sequences but I think I've, I think I remember there's being more which really tells you just how strong of an element that was to me that I remember I mean there's really only like three I think and it's only very brief and, and we also we don't get a good look at the the Iron Maiden you know we, we it's it's only very very brief it's enough obviously but yeah it's now and I like that you know as Ichabod walks into town everyone closes their windows He's not even bringing his ass into town. And, and you know, both Ichabod and the audience notices that someone is making out right next to the front door, but we don't know how important that is for a while. You know, at first it's just like, well, don't mind me walking into the, the house itself, you know, just even from right away several people are very grateful to Ichabod coming to to solve the murders and it is this you know I like that we get the just the the servant girl Sarah we actually don't see very much of her at all but the movie just makes sure that we do know that she's there you know she comes in and says thank God you're here to Ichabod you know and then later we're told that she's missing and we find out that she was murdered by Lady Van Tassel to make, you know, so that it would appear that she was dead. What was she gonna do when she came back? I guess it was just, was it just supposed to get Ichabod to believe she was dead and then leave town and then when she comes back she would just say yeah and anyway and you know we don't realize right away but you know later when we see well you know Sarah and I'm sorry Ian McDermott I don't remember his character name there are way too many 
middle-aged to old white dudes in this movie who have important jobs. I cannot remember all of them and all of their names, all of their jobs. But, you know, Sarah and Ian sitting in a tree, standing next to the front door. You know, once we we can later kind of deduce, ah, it must have been, you know, because we didn't see, you know, there were certain people that weren't in the, the building right away, so it must have been, you know. And as soon as Ichabod walks into the room with the, the various old men, we're told about the reverend and the notary, and we don't right away necessarily think that those are going to be super important. But we almost kind of should, because what we saw earlier was clearly a marriage, which would require a reverend and a notary. So it's, yeah, very, very nicely. And yeah, and Ichabod asks of, you know, who are, do you have any suspects? And he's told the legend of the horseman. I love Christopher Walken's performance. It is just, it is pure gold. And we see the, the two sisters without realizing how important they are. And we get a brief glimpse of the family tree from inside the, the Bible that, you know, the reverend walks up and says, this is the only book you're going to need and slams it down. I appreciate that he did that for effect, but really, the like the coffee cup almost like you know it could have gotten a stain on that table. So it is kind of just, dude, just just put it down. You're not in that much of a hurry. You you have time to just slowly put it out. But he did it for effect, obviously. And yeah, you know, again, the family tree will be extremely important, but we don't know that yet. Yeah, around half an hour into the movie, we get our, the first flashback to Ichabod's childhood. We don't see what the father does to the mother, but we can clearly tell that he does not accept her ways. I quite appreciate, you know, relatively close to the ending of the movie, Masbeth says to Ichabod, how could you possibly think that Katrina did this? And Ichabod responds, sometimes wickedness hides behind the veneer of the, ah, uh, let me think. Yeah, be behind the, yeah, the, the veneer of, of the, of, of something good or something like that, which, you know, <sighs> So, you know, perhaps what taught him that was that his father did some cruel things in the name of Christianity. And I quite like that Ichabod asserts that there is no horseman right before the horseman reveals himself to him. Which, again, like, that's, that's, a, that's a clue. This movie is not to be taken completely seriously. Like, it's almost... If the horseman had a head, he would be saying, oh yeah, you, I don't exist? Well, here I am. You know, it's just, yeah, like, even for, like, dramatic irony or something, that's, that's really, really on the nose. And as the horseman rides towards Ichabod, at first we think it's going to attack Ichabod, but then it just claims the decapitated head, which... Again, like, the moment that you see this head, I think that's the one that spins around and then rolls off and it rolls and lands between Johnny Depp's legs, you know, facing him. At that point, it's like, okay, this movie is not to be taken completely seriously, obviously. You know, this is, it's having some fun with the, yeah. And Ichabod faints in bed after seeing the horseman. You know, he faints right after the horseman claims the head, and then he comes to in bed and faints again. And we see a little more of his childhood mother and a glimpse of the Iron Maiden. Young Masbeth, sorry. 
only mass, but is the only one who will go with Ichabod. I do, I, I think that he's kind of, you know, he's, he's trying, he's trying to make a good impression, and, you know, he doesn't really have anybody to take care of him, and, and, yeah, you know, the, just the, she says, now, who will go with me? And just, like, everyone is standing there, not it, and, and he's, I'll go with you, just, he's, he's, like, charming lad, he's, you know, yeah. But I, I really appreciate that, you know, it's, he spends some time in, in bed trying to, to cope with, you know, having seen the horseman, but, you know, he says afterwards, I have conquered my, I faced my fear and conquered it, something like that. And yeah, he has, you know, he's, he still faints every now and then. He, you know, he gets scared of, like, spiders and such, but at the end of the day, he's, he is, he is facing, he, he is, if, if the horseman had a face, Ichabod would now be coming face to face with him. And Maspeth points out how quiet it is in the part of the woods. There are no, no birds, no animal sounds. I love the scene with the witch, which is tense. And the witch demonstrates that she can't, you know, she can't completely reach Ichabod with the chains on. And, you know, she, I, I guess the idea is that she gets possessed or something. And then tells Ichabod how to get to the Tree of the Dead. I really love the, it's, again, that's when you just, if you were, if you thought you were watching a serious horror movie, then obviously when you see the the ridiculous witch's head with the eyes and the, you know, at that point it's like, okay, this is not, you, you, you know, this is not suspenseful, this is not scary, this is funny, you know, but it is meant to be. It's not that they didn't realize how ridiculous. It is very sweet of Katrina to join Ichabod. I mean, if any tree should bleed human blood, it would be the tree of the dead, wouldn't it? And Ichabod finds all the decapitated heads in the tree. That is one tree that knows how to get a head in life, or in death, as it were. It is really cool to see the headless horseman. You know, like, you see the, the some of the, the skin regrow on, you know, it's in the, the grave there, and then you see the, the, the horse itself coming out of the, the tree, just, yeah. I mean, considering that the Headless Horseman has made him faint at least twice so far, it is pretty courageous of Ichabod to try to ride after him. Considering how many deaths there are in this movie, I really appreciate that as we find out near the end of the movie, every single one of them is with a pur you know, yeah, with a purpose. The horseman never kills for absolutely no reason, although obviously when he kills Brom, it's because Brom was being a bit of a bother to him. You know, it wasn't that Lady Van Tassel wanted Brom dead, but yeah, everybody else, you know, they knew something that would mean the, the, you know, the inheritance. Yeah. Excuse me. We barely spent excuse me, any time with the midwife and her husband, but Tim Burton makes sure that we know that they do really love each other, so it hurts even more when we see them killed. You know, I mentioned in the, in the review that the... I, th I think the, you know, there's maybe one, you know, one relationship in the movie where, like, a close relationship where you do really believe it. I believe the, the, the two of them love each other. That that really comes across. I, I'm not sure that Christina Ricci and Johnny Depp have that much... <sighs> ah. Chemistry. The word is chemistry. And apparently, you know, Johnny Depp knew Christina Ricci 
since she was like nine years old. So when he did this movie, he he felt that it was kind of, you know, he felt it was awkward to try to play romantic interests together since he'd known, you know, and apparently, ah, I forget what movie it was, but there was one of the, you know, Christina Ricci made movies as a child as well, and in, I forget which it was, but like, there was at least one of those where Johnny Depp, was he also in the movie, or did he just visit the set, I forget, I think it, you know, I've noted some stuff in the IMDb trivia section, excuse me, so, but, you can understand, you know, if he looks at her and he thinks, I've known you since you were nine, you know, obviously that's going to, like, he's going to have a harder time appearing to be in love with her. Now. Right before the Headless Horseman enters the midwife's house, we see the sign asking that people knock before enter, and then the Headless Horseman doesn't knock. Considering he's about to murder these people, that's a bit of gallows humor, which is something Tim Burton excels at. I mean, the story reason for the Headless Horseman killing the midwife, her husband, and her son is that she might have told them that the Widow Winship was pregnant, you know, in addition to the fact that Tim Burton dislikes that children are so often spared in horror movies. You know, it's not just completely random, but it is still, I don't love when horror movies, kill, when movies in general kill off children. It's, it's just, yeah. Once again, I think, I think if you're going to kill a child, if you're going to do something that taboo, you have to explore what it does. You know, I've seen some movies that do a great job of exploring what it does to people when they lose, you know, for example, children. As Casper Van Dien turns to ride after the noise, I just like to imagine that his internal monologue has him cursing him to face more of these bugs. With Brahms Roughnecks. I mean, in the Headless Horseman's defense, he does give Brom numerous chances to just stop fighting. He doesn't just kill him immediately. And yeah, about 58 minutes into the movie, and we get the reveal of the death of Ichabod's mother in the Iron Maiden, and him accidentally sitting on the chair with spikes. Yikes. And Ichabod realizes about the will due to the notary an hour and maybe four minutes into the movie. And that, you know, it's it's like two-thirds of the way into the mystery, and we think, ah, we know what's going on, you know, the, yeah. And Ichabod doesn't want to tell Katrina that he suspects her father. And I like how, like, we saw him write down the individual words in the book earlier, but we didn't really stop to think about what it ends up spelling out, which <laughs> the secret, secret conspiracy points to Van Tassel. You know, it is, yeah. And, let's see. yeah, and Katrina burns the evidence and asserts that, you know, it couldn't be her father, the, you know, in, you know, getting these people killed. And we do realize, you know, she is right in asserting that. And Lady Van Tassel tells Baltus that she will use some flowers on her cut, which, you know, when we see her with the flowers and we see the horseman riding, you know, we assume, like Baltus does, that she must be dead. And the horseman throws an axe onto the hollow ground, and we see what would happen if he himself were to walk on it. 
it's it's really great. There there are way too many movies where there's something critical like that, and we just don't get a proper explanation for how. But I mean, basically, the horseman knows what's going to happen. He just wants to make sure, so he throws an axe rather than ride onto, and you know what happens confirms what the horseman believed, and tells Ichabod. You know, he really can't step on to be, because Ichabod is someone who doesn't, I mean, he, he's never, it's never said that he's like an outright atheist, but you don't really get the sense that he has a lot of faith in religion, you know, so it is something that he wouldn't necessarily think would be, yeah. I think the escalation in the church works really well. You understand why they're panicking, and really, Baltus wasn't really overreacting. He was being threatened. You know, the, the guy, uh, Reverend, I want to say, literally said, we should throw you out to the horseman. You're the one he wants. Ooh, ooh, ooh. And, yeah, like, I'm sorry. In that situation, I'd probably grab a gun, too. And I like that he, you know, once he fires the gun, he then, you know, he's still anxious, so he grabs somebody else's gun rather than stand there and spend forever reloading the gun. Since back then, those guns took a while. Yeah. And we see that Katrina drew something on the church floor, which at first makes us wonder if she's controlling the horseman, but we later realize she was trying to protect people from the horseman. And Ichabod realizes the woman with the cut on her hand can't be Lady Van Tassel. And about an hour and 20 minutes in, we start getting the explanation by Lady Van Tassel. And it is maybe 15 minutes between that and the movie, and, and the end credits start rolling. So that's a good, you know, you don't want terribly long time between the that kind of reveal of, you know, this is what actually happened in the in the whole mystery thing you know after that you kind of wanted to to end not terribly long after excuse me and we realized that lady van tassel was the one who broke the branch which led to the hessian getting killed which it's just like you know, kid, you didn't have to do that. I mean, I guess she did just want to see what would happen. I think that's the supposed to be the implication. Again, I'm not saying she deserves what happens, but yeah. And I love the reveal that Lady Van Tassel knew that Masbeth was right there. She was just waiting for the right moment to jump scare him. Like, she, it sounds like she's talking to Katrina still, but she's actually started talking to Masbeth. She, had, she, just, she just hasn't turned to, to face him yet. You know, she's saying, I had to kill my sister, the witch, because she did tell you and your master. You know, just, that's, that's a really fun... And again, like, that's, it's such a, it's like, the movie is winking at the audience, you know. It's the kind of thing where you might expect that Masbeth would be able to knock her out. You know, that would be a more typical horror, you know, horror movie uh, thing to happen in that situation. The entire scene of the mill is absolutely incredible. And, you know... At first, it might appear that they don't really accomplish anything, but they do manage to slow down the horsemen. And if they hadn't gotten the head start, again, it wouldn't have worked out. You know, that the head start gets them... Uh, let me think. Well, yeah, once they... The head start ends up with them arriving at where Lady Van Tassel is, and that's how they're able to grab the skull and give it to, yeah that's how Ichabod grabs the skull and throws it to the horseman 
The climax uses the various elements really well. You've got the carriage moving fast and trying to get away from the horseman. You've got the horseman trying to get to the front of the carriage to kill Kuchina. And Ichabod is trying to prevent him from getting there, which also leads to the, the horseman trying to kill Ichabod. Very brave of Ichabod to approach Lady Van Tassel as she's pointing a gun at Katrina. And it does, of course, lead to the very, you know, he got himself shot. And it is quite clever. You know, she literally says, this book will protect you. And it does. It stops a bullet. It's It actually turned out to, she meant in a in a sort of supernatural sense, but it ended up having a very practical, physical application there. And yeah, the, the you know, it, it was, I have forgotten. Maybe I'll think of it later. I didn't forget the word. Bird is the word, but I forgot where I was going. I could watch the horseman putting his skull back on a million times and still love how ridiculous the effect was intentionally made to look. It's just, it is glorious. You know, this movie does have some of that you know, early CG work, which the 90s had a lot of, perhaps especially in horror movies. I, yeah, I remember a number of horror movies that had. But here it was intentionally supposed to look kind of ridiculous. The, the horseman's skull and the witch's face. Now, once the headless horseman disappeared back into the Tree of the Dead, the movie's almost over, but Ichabod had one more fainting in him. One of the first things Katrina does, and one of the very last things Katrina does in this movie, is kiss Ichabod on the cheek. And it is this sort of, you know, the their relationship has changed a lot since the very first time. You know, the first time she kisses him on the cheek, it's this sort of thing of she, you know, she can express love to someone she doesn't even know yet. But then there at the end, it is this sort of thing of, you know, they trust each other, they are together. Despite, you know, him thinking that her father was guilty and her, I, I find her it to be very understandable, very sympathetic that she gets upset with him for, you know, seemingly, I mean, yeah, he, he does think that her father is guilty. And, yeah, so the movie is an hour and 35 and a half minutes long without end credits, and an hour and 41 minutes long with them. And that brings us to the next section. Notes taken before watching. So I opened this section mentioning what some of the other work I know of the people who made it. And I'm just really quickly going to say right off the bat, I love almost everything I've seen by Tim Burton. It has been years since I've watched, you know, other than his two Batman movies, it's been years, and, and this obviously, it's been years since I watched his work. So. I don't know, maybe he doesn't hold up, but yeah. So I will just briefly mention what I have watched by him. Beetlejuice, Batman, Edward Scissorhands, Batman Returns, and The Nightmare Before Christmas. I realize he didn't direct it, but he did write it. Mars Attacks, Corpse Bride, Sweeney Todd the Demon Barber, Fleet Street, Alice in Wonderland, and Dark Shadows. And... 
I would probably, you know, Alice in Wonderland, Dark Shadows, I probably wouldn't rate that highly today. I was prob I was just being very forgiving at the time. I wasn't quite ready to give up on Tim Burton. I understand why others have, you know, the, yeah, but other than those two, I love his work. I, I absolutely love the, the tone he goes for and most of the time nails and just, yeah. And I will briefly say I have heard that his version of Sweeney Todd is not the most compelling version of it, and I, you know, I, it's the only version I know, so I loved it, but I could, you know, I understand people being frustrated when someone gets a lot of glory for something that they adapted if their adaptation was not the best adaptation, but just the most, maybe the most well-known adaptation, and that I do, I can completely understand that, but I do think the, you know, the performances by Johnny Depp, Helena Bonham Carter, Sasha Baron Cohen, which I re like, when I heard that Ali G was going to be acting in the movie, I really wasn't sure what I was going to get, but yeah, he does incredible in it. And, let's see, there was the, ah, um, uh, Simon in the first Die Hard, he's the Sheriff of Nottingham in the Kevin Costner Robin Hood, and in Galaxy Quest, he, you know, by, by Grathar's hammer, I avenge the I don't remember his name right now, but he does great in, you know, in Sweeney Todd, in other movies as well. And let's see. Yeah, and, and Andrew Kevin Walker wrote this, you know, known for Seven, and he was an uncredited script doctor on Event Horizon. He wrote the game eight millimeter and uncredited script doctor on Fight Club and he wrote Panic Room and the Wolfman. Okay, so yeah, I realize you know Panic Room and the Wolfman are not quite as and and maybe also eight millimeter, but other than that, yeah, that is very, very strong work. So and Let's see. I really love Miranda Richardson in this. I haven't seen her in as much stuff as I'd like to. I've watched her black and her stuff. She's in the 2000 Get Carter. She is incredible in Spider. And yeah, that's right. She's also in Southland Tales. That movie does have a lot of familiar faces. Yeah. I remember when, when that director was thought of as just a genius because of the uh, the other one he did with Jake Gyllenhaal, Donnie Darko, and then he made Southland Tales, and then people were like, oh, okay, he had one in him that was good, and then that was, oh, wait, do we need to rewatch? And then people rewatched Donnie Darko, and then they were like, huh. I remember this being a lot better. I don't know if Donnie Darko is a good movie or not, but it's definitely a movie that when you rewatch it after seeing Southland Tales, you're like, maybe I was just kind of forgiving of all this kind of stuff because it's, yeah. 
If you love it, that's great. I'm not trying to take that away from you. And let's see. Oh, right. Jeffrey Jones is in this, and he's in Howard the Duck as Dr. Walter Jenning, and a character that is kind of a spoiler to read out. So, but just, yeah, that's, hmm. yeah, I don't blame people who did that. You know, they thought it was going to be a good movie. You know, that's, yeah. And I appreciate that this movie does work in some of the stuff from the original story, such as Ichabod, at least nearly being scared away by Brom, who poses as the Headless Horseman. I saw a reviewer say that he liked excuse me, that Depp's character does accept that the supernatural exists, excuse me, but still applies his logical thinking, and I agree. He neither keeps denying that the horseman is supernatural, which would be ridiculous, nor does he start fully using supernatural methods, which would just be, like, at that point, I could understand why someone might make that choice, but I think it would be the wrong choice. It really is just, no, you, you gotta... It's, it's great that he, he continues to apply the, the, you know, he's not talking about all the supernatural. He's just saying, well, the horseman is being controlled by someone, so we got to find out who that is. And he, yeah, he investigates, you know, it's, I, I, I'm not saying all horror movies should, but I would like more horror movies to have one of the main characters investigating the seemingly supernatural going on. I think it makes excuse me, for incredibly compelling. You know, there's this, there's the ring, the thing. Let's see. I guess those are off the top of my head. The ones that yeah, you know, it makes the movies, but Alien, you know, they're trying to understand the thing they're going up against. It's not just that they're being scared by, yeah. I think the mystery works pretty well. You know, by the end of the movie, we, we understand that the way Mary Archer, Mary Archer saw it, that inheritance was her birthright, and she'd be damned if it went to an illegitimate child of Baltus Van Tassel, so she hit the Headless Horseman's skull, and the one portal from the living world to hell she knew, up that tree's ass, and a number of years that tree wore the skull up its ass. You can't possibly be surprised that I worked that in there. So I watched various YouTube videos that were more or less related to this movie, including Obscura's Lupa's review of Sleepy Hollow High, which is in fact not particularly related, but it's a it's an enjoyable review. And you know the Nostalgia Critics video. Is Sleepy Hollow secretly brilliant? Where he goes over the numerous ways that you know this movie is similar to Ham Hammer Horror, and ten things you didn't know about Sleepy Hollow, where where he expresses that the reason this movie is less like today than when it came out is because people keep thinking about the other later released bad Tim Burton Johnny Depp movies, and he feels that this movie is Tim Burton at his best with excellent direction and visuals. And Johnny Depp is quirky, but not too much. I agree. I, yeah, I can completely understand why some people might watch a movie like the Alice in Wonderland and be like, wow, that is way too quirky, Johnny Depp. And then, you know, accidentally, you know, maybe like 
if you watch this movie, like, like how I said about Donnie Darko and Southland Tales, if you watch this movie with that baggage, then you might not. Once again, for all I know, Donnie Darko's brilliant. I'm not going to pretend that I... I thought it was kind of difficult to, to decipher all the, the stuff, but I remember liking it the first time. And I think the very first time I watched it, I at least felt like I understood what it was, but I don't know. I might have just been high off the, just, you know, it's so exciting to try to understand the thing. And if you think you understand, and then you're really happy, but then later you might think back and be like, wait, that doesn't actually make sense. Now, yes, so I watched the YouTube trailer, you know, the 2 minute 25 second trailer. There's also one that's 2 minute 21 seconds, but it is the same as far as I can tell. You know, do, does a good job getting you excited about the movie and at telling you a lot without telling you too much. And I watched Honest Trailers, every Tim Burton movie, you know, yeah, it's it's a lot of fun. It's, it's a really good, yeah. And, let's see. Yeah, and I found this review, let's see, 11 and a half minutes. And the, yeah, this, this guy did not really like it. So I'm going to quote some of what he said that I thought, you know, I, I understand what he says. I don't completely agree, but, you know, if this can help spread the good word. It's a Frankenstein together movie that wants to be all of these different movies and ends up being none of them. I didn't buy the romance between Johnny Depp and Christina Ricci. She's given nothing to do. Too many flashbacks to the parents? I am over Danny Elfman. Not everything needs to sound like a live-action cartoon. The movie is a feature-length Halloween decoration. It has no soul. It's not an act of creativity. It's a product like a Happy Meal. And... Right. So, I watched the DVD special special features, including the commentary track by... You know, it's, it's Tim Burton and only him. And... You know, I'm not going to repeat everything he says because a lot of it is already in the trivia section on IMDb, but he says that when Ichabod says not to move the body, he actually doesn't know what he's talking about, but he's pretending to, which is something Johnny Depp can relate to. And he liked having Christina Ricci, you know, she used to, she, she had been playing a number of dark roles, and you know, he thought it would be fun to have her be blonde and wearing white in this and be a more, you know, a less dark character. He wanted to make sure each head chop had its own spin, so to speak. He likes Johnny Depp. Right. He likes how Johnny Depp faints and Christina Ricci's fainting as well. And he says, there's a, you know, one of the times that Christina Ricci screams, in the movie, he says she's a good screamer and a good fainter. And when we see the, the ending, you know, right before the end credits start, at first he says, oh, it's a happy ending. But then he says, well, you know, young Matt is still being treated like a slave, so maybe it's not such a happy ending. And, yeah, so I watched the DVD, the, the featurette, Behind the Legend. And it's 29 minutes long. Where, yeah, one of them says it's part of your subconscious. I think he was, they were talking about the, the sense of the, the atmosphere, maybe the original story, something like that. And, you know, one of them says Johnny Depp plays a character who lives inside of his head versus a man with no head. I think that might have been Tim Burton who said that. It sounds like a Tim Burton thing to say. And Christina Ricci's character is very romantic. And there's some witchcraft. You see a lot of the detail of the severed heads. We talk about how beautiful the the tree of the dead is. I think they, they just refer to it as the gnarled tree. Maybe they don't like saying the tree of the dead in a in a positive sense. I could I could understand that. And someone said that Tim has a great sense of humor and loves splattering Johnny Depp with blood. 
and there's great humor on set. And then there are 11 minutes of cast interviews. Johnny says that his character is very sensitive. Christina Ricci says her character is like a princess waiting for the prince to arrive. And she kisses someone she doesn't know while she has a blindfold on because she's so open. She says Miranda Richardson steals the movie. And Casper Van Dien gets really excited recounting the fight scene he has with the horseman. It's, it's really cool. You And you can tell. It, it shows in the movie like he loves doing the fighting. And... Christina says she loves scary movies, she loves watching a movie and being scared. And the DVD also comes with a teaser trailer and a trailer, and yeah, both of them do a really good job getting excited about the movie, and, you know, the teaser doesn't show them very much, but the trailer, you know, shows a lot without showing too much, like, like the online trailer. I forget if... did I find out that they're actually the same? I feel like I saw two different ones, but then I'm not entirely sure. And the DVD also came with a photo gallery and cast biographies, you know, around eight and a half minutes of, of reading time. And, the, you know, it's, it's a good read. I don't really have anything to, you know, ah, what's the word, to, to add to that. And I read Rod's abridged script. You know, it's it's fine. It was back when he wrote. You know, sometimes his abridged scripts were indeed very short. And I don't know. I I would like if someone, maybe not Rod himself, someone on the site did a new version and went into more detail. But it's, it's fine for what it is. You know, he wrote it back in 1999, and this was the kind of script he wrote back then, so. And... Let's Yeah, so right, and then there's the the review by Outlaw Outlaw Vern, yeah. It's, it's a lot of fun. I don't really have anything to comment on. And it, it's... Yeah, you know, I recommend you read it. Now, let's see. is pretty much it for this section so yeah that brings us to the final section critic sites IMDb and Wikipedia Yeah, I'm going to start with a couple of Rotten Tomatoes critic reviews that I thought really, you know, nailed something. Burton's vision of the ominous woods, the shadowy town, and its pale inhabitants give the film texture and bring it to life. Sleepy Hollow is, above all, beautiful to look at. Instead of using effects to make things look real, Burton makes everything look like a painting. Excuse me. Burton, for all his skill, never ranges 
beyond the thrills of the obvious. He doesn't enlarge the meaning of the horror he shows us the way a Brian De Palma might. That's very true. I would really, that, that would be incredible to see Brian De Palma's Sleepy Hollow. That, yeah. Let's see. Yeah, the Burton trademark special effects are typically fun, but the late release and the lackluster performances make Sleepy Hollow feel exactly like its title, Sleepy and Hollow. See, I, I would not go that far, but I can understand what they mean. No longer a prodigy at age 41, Tim Burton has now become a problem. I still find myself watching his movies with bemused tolerance thinking surely he'll be a great director when he grows up. Not devilishly funny enough to be a black comedy, not remotely scary enough to be an effective thriller, and too deficient in chemistry to be any kind of a romance. I mean, yeah, I, I disagree on the, you know, on whether it's scary enough, but it definitely is, you know, I don't blame anyone who tried to watch this movie and couldn't get scared enough at it. Let's continue. The pace and tension are both kept up throughout the film, aided and abetted Cute. by Danny Elfman's dramatic score and the remarkable visuals. The weaknesses of Sleepy Hollow are trivial, but they unravel the mar marvelous visual fabric that Burton has woven. And again, I, I don't completely agree with that, but I definitely see what they mean. It's, yeah. I wouldn't go as far as they go, I guess is the word to phrase it. Burton has made a wonderful monster movie from a script that doesn't understand this is a monster movie. Yeah, yeah. I can kind of see what, yeah. One second. Burton's richest, prettiest, weirdest since Batman Returns. And yeah, one said a horror story without much horror. As for that tagline, heads are more likely to be scratched, and it's the eyes that will be doing the rolling during Sleepy Hollow. Clever. More about scenery than people. That is sadly true. A hollow wood production that couldn't be more hollow or Hollywoodish. A lavish art directed slasher movie. Yeah. An exquisitely mounted effort created to be the exact specifications of an adroit director whose sensibility is truly bizarre. Sleepy Hollow is kind of an ultimate Tim Burton movie. It's an interesting blend of Walkerian concerns with the compromised detective looking for truth in a corrupted world, excuse me, and Berton, excuse me, Bertonian obsession with the outcast embedded in the very society that spurns him. I think that's Andrew Kevin Walker, not Christopher Wal Oh, right, Christopher Walken, sorry. But yeah. Creepy and atmospheric, a perfect blend of Tim Burton imagination and Johnny Depp charisma. Yeah, this, this, I think this, this is a user review on Rotten Tomatoes, and this person said, the film could have done with an extra 40 minutes or so runtime to really flesh out the plot. Yeah, there's definitely some. And... This is a very bloody fantasy. Reds do eke their way into the black and blues. 
but it's hard to think of another film with as many severed heads whose overall tone is so sweet. There's, there's a Metacritic critic review and some more of... Yeah, there must be nine or ten thwacks to the neck throughout Sleepy Hollow, and Burton finds a different way to make the resulting severed noggin fall as though you'd forgotten the last one. More creepy and flesh-crawling than overwhelmingly gory, it nevertheless takes pride in characters who get splattered with blood as often as takeout fries get doused with catsup. A fun horror film with fun visuals, not, uh, not lacking for a good story, pretty good job staying true to the original tale, but it is very dark, which adds a sense, a really, a sense of evil in the Headless Horseman. That was a Metacritic user review. And, let's see. Yeah, and this was a, this was a negative review. I think this person gave it a 4 out of 10. But how do we get from one scene to the next? We use Depp. He meanders through the story, stumbles into caves, plunges into forests, and trips over bodies. There is no investigation as such, he is just led on. When he gets stuck, a witch tells him where to go next, or a sidekick finds something and says, You have to see this, sir. And then he leads him to the scary tree, and the girl in white tells you its name. It isn't a bad movie, because even on my laptop it looks interesting, but it is evident that the story and characters are just there for the visuals. Pity, considering all the acting talent available. And... Again, it goes further than I would personally, but there is definitely some truth there. And yeah, so that brings us to IMDb, and I am just really quickly going to go into the... Yeah, there are seven taglines. Who will it come for next? Watch your head. Heads will roll, which for some reason someone thought... It was necessary to write both the German and the Eng both. It's for some reason it's both there in German and in English. Even though right after the German, it writes it in English. So yeah, beware. Close your eyes. Say your prayers. Sleep if you can. You can lock the doors. You can bolt the windows. But can you survive the night? I mean, I think they they do a good job of making the headless horseman feel ever present like he kind of i mean really there isn't a single night in the movie that he doesn't attack someone i th i think now let's see it was only after being cast as the headless horseman that christopher walken admitted to director tim burton that he actually did not know how to ride a horse so despite playing the Hessian horseman, he's not actually a horseman, he's also not Hessian, but he is the man, and one out of three is better than nothing. Johnny Depp did all of his own stunts for the final scene where he is dragged by the horse. He had bulletproof clothing underneath his wardrobe. That is... wow. And historically, Ichabod Crane was a very unattractive man. Johnny Depp offered to add prosthetics to his face to make himself look ugly, but director Tim Burton wanted to base the character on Crane's more unattractive personality traits, his reported squeamishness and eccentricity. The cast and crew often said, the feeling one had walking around Sleepy Hollow sets, and in particular the town of Lime Tree, was almost as if you were walking around the inside of Tim Burton's head. The Headless Horseman, Christopher Walken, speaks no word throughout the movie. He makes a few wordless shouted commands to his horse and shh admonishments to witnesses. That's, yeah. He really does only go rah, rah, and yeah, it's, it's incredible. 
the western wood was built on a soundstage so everything, including the weather and light, could be controlled. Which I think really, that's one of the things that it adds to the movie, but it also detracts from it. Because it is definitely, like, if nobody told you that a lot of this movie was simply not... I don't like the word the words not natural, but that is essentially like when you see when you see what appears to be the outside in this, a lot of the time it is a set constructed on a state on you know a sound stage, and you may not be able to put your finger on it, but you can tell that there's something off, and that is and ultimately it does make the movie feel. In, in some ways it adds because it you know they did something similar with the hammer horror movies and there it, it lent a feel of the supernatural to them and it does that here as well some but at times you it really does feel like this is just this is not really it's not real it's just a it's a creation it's something that you know it feels phony and fake. Miranda Richardson's Watch Your Head was ad-libbed during filming. That's awesome. For those who don't remember, that she says that, I want to say it's right before, is it right as they're getting into the mill, maybe? It's, it's somewhere around there. And, you know, the Headless Horseman is after them. So, yeah, watch your head. Winona Ryder was offered the role of Trinum Van Tassel, but turned it down. I mean, I think she would be fine in it. I... You know, I... I, I think it would be too bad if Christina Ricci... Like, is this the one movie that Christina... The one Tim Burton movie that Christina Ricci appeared in? Or was the one other? I forget. But it's, you know, again... To quote Nostalgia Chick, you would think that they were, uh, yeah, let me think. I think that was where she said that you would, you would think that Tim Burton grew Christina Ricci in a lab so that he could put her in movies, but no, they barely worked together, you know. I mean, it's not impossible. It might still happen. They're both still alive and making movies, but it really is wild that they didn't Back then, you know, they, they, yeah, they barely had made movies together. Now, let's see. The town of Sleepy Hollow was created from the ground up in three months. At the time of filming, it was the largest set built in England and was put up in record time. The last set that held this record was built for Billy Elliot. Excuse me. Tim Burton's second R-rated movie, that's right. It wasn't the very first. The fake forests built on the sound stages became real forests by the time they wrapped. They became infested with bugs and birds, he said. The sound of birds in this movie are often that of real uninvited creatures that had made their home in the trees. The windmill was too large to be constructed on a sound stage because it was over five stories high. The sails alone weighed over two tons. And it was, you know, it was worth building that thing because that is an incredible scene. Now, let's see.
Christopher Walken, the Headless Horseman, played a school teacher in the Dead Zone, in the beginning of which she tells his class to read The Legend of Sleepy Hollow. Now, let's see. The role of the Witch of the Western Woods was originally much larger than in the Finnish movie. Dialogue about her was originally in the scene where Ichabod and Katrina have their midnight talk. These lines made it into the trailer. Later, in a deleted scene, Ichabod would have found the beheaded body of the witch outside her cave. The blood all over the ground was to have alerted him that this, this was done by a human killer instead of the horseman, and him spotting the witch's missing necklace on Katrina's neck when she faints from the church was the final evidence for Ichabod that Katrina was behind it all. So it, it is, I mean, as it is now, it really does feel like the witch is just barely there. You know, obviously she's important because she says, she guides them to the Tree of the Dead, but it really, like, you've got that scene with the Tree of the Dead, her giving directions to the Tree of the Dead, and then we see her killed and we're told that she was, you know, the other of the little girls in the Hessian oh, horseman flashback. You know, it, it really does feel like, you you can tell that it was... You know, it feels like there should have been more there. Ray Park, best known for his turn as Darth Maul in Star Wars Episode One: The Friends of Menace, and Solo's. That's a spoiler, so I hope you didn't hear enough to realize. I mean, I already knew the spoiler. I'm trying to avoid spoiling it for other people. Was the fighting and stunt double for the Headless Horseman? Tim Burton credits Park with giving the character a great sense of movement. The character doesn't have a head, so you don't have much else to go on. And I agree. It really is like. You can really tell when a, a stunt performer or someone performing a, a character like that, what, you know, when it's someone incredibly talented and when it's someone who's, you know, just, yeah, who's, who's doing their best, but isn't, you know, but, but no, Ray Park is very, very talented for, for that. Christina Ricci revealed on the Rosie O'Donnell show that Christopher Walken was very shy and quiet, so the other cast members had a competition over who could get him to say the most words. Miranda Richardson won by making him answer lots of questions. That's that's kind of yeah, that's that's sweet. You you wouldn't really think that Christopher Walken was was shy, considering some of the roles he's played, but yeah. Roughly 75% of this movie was shot on sound stages. Johnny Depp has never seen the film because he hates the way he acts in it. That's too bad. Miranda Richardson, who plays Lady Fantasmalist, played Queen Elizabeth I in Black Under 2, and the Queen of Hearts in Alice in Wonderland, Wonderland from 1999, both characters notorious for threats of beheading. When I first read that, I had to, you know, it's, it's good that they put in the, the, the year that the movie is from, because I was like, no, that was Helena Bonham Carter who played the Queen of Hearts, but that's, you know, different Alice in Wonderland. And Casper Van Dien is excellent on horseback. Johnny Depp, not so much. 
The first script had to have some of its violence toned down. Even so, it's one of Tim Burton's glorious films. I could see Andrew Kevin Wald. He, he does write very violent movies, so yeah. Tim Burton says he prefers to start the movie's music as soon as possible over the opening studio and distributor logos. I see someone else listen to the commentary track. <laughs> Christmas Eve 1998 spent dragging Johnny Depp through leaves all day. Tim Burton seemed pretty okay with that. Tom Stopper did some uncredited touch-up work on the script to give it more humor. Lightning precedes each horseman appearance slash attack. Yeah, that's that's a good yeah. Filmmakers had hoped to shoot on location in upstate New York, but the places they looked at didn't lend themselves to the expressionism they wanted. Crane's being out of his depth is emphasized by his mounting and dismounting his horse on the right side rather than the left. Daniel Day-Lewis, Liam Neeson, and Brad Pitt were considered for Ichabod Crane. This was merely a formality requested by the studio as Johnny Depp was always the first choice for the role. I gotta admit, I don't really see how... Yeah, it sounds like they just... Here's some bankable names. Here's some, like, real... Daniel Day-Lewis and Liam Neeson. I can't see that at all. Although, I mean, I was about to say to Liam Neeson, this is, you know, I mean, him coming off something like Schindler's List, but then in 1999, he was in the, the Haunting remake, so... You know, if that movie wasn't beneath him, then this certainly wasn't either, but... Yeah, I just, I, I gotta admit, Liam Neeson with, with Johnny Depp quirks, I have a hard time. Seeing. And and that was what Tim Burton wanted. It wasn't what Jim, you know, unlike Johnny Depp started doing the movie and he was like, I'm gonna do my quirks. No, Tim Burton wanted him to do a bunch of quirks. So, yeah, I gotta admit, this, uh, and, and Brad Pitt, yeah, I just don't think he's, he's right. You know, these are, these are excellent actors for sure, but just not. Marlon Brando, of all people, was the first choice to play the Hessian. I, yeah, I cannot see that at all. I'm not going to lie. That is, once again, unbelievably talented actor, you know. But, yeah, that just... Johnny Depp wanted to add prosthetics to his face to make Ichabod more unattractive in line with his book counterpart. Burton decided against it, feeling Ichabod's personality quirks were what made him unattractive. Sir Michael Gambon wanted to keep his severed head and send it via proxy to interviews and dinner parties as a joke. There are 18 decapitations in this movie. And that's not even, there, there are even more people that die. Because there are a couple of deaths that aren't by decapitation. In order to escape the Headless Horseman, Ichabod sets fire to the windmill. Instead of simply burning down, the windmill explodes in a huge fireball. This would be due to a dust explosion, which is when a fine powder suspended in the air like flour is ignited. And, yeah, that, I gotta admit, when I, the first time I saw the scene, I was like, oh, come on, why would it blow up? But, man, eh, you know, because I'm so used to when it happens in American movies, it's often just for effect. But, yeah, it actually would have happened like that. The fact that the horseman is following orders and hunting down specific targets, not just a mindless killer who slaughters everything he can, is foreshadowed when he initially spares Ichabod and Braun, but ultimately kills the latter when he continues to attack him by bisecting him. Mm -hmm. 
Miranda Richardson plays both the Lady Anne Tassel and, that's right, they are supposed to be twins, yeah. The Witch in the Western Woods. Yeah, this is a, a good point. I think this might be a plot hole. This is from IMDb Goof section. Logically, Lady Van Tassel should have ordered the horsemen to kill Katrina before killing Baltus. With no living children, Baltus' heir would have automatically been his widow. There is no mention of Katrina having a will, so there was no guarantee that her death would make the estate go directly to her stepmother, especially since Lady Van Tassel was already presumed dead. And that's and it's a good point because she's very methodical with her plan. You know, her, the, I mean, that's essentially the only really mistake in her plan. If you want to be completely just, if you only look at whether or not her plan would work, the rest of her plan does work. And she, you know, she's very methodical, very careful to kill people she needs to, but not ones she doesn't, but... Yeah, the the her faking her own death doesn't really work for her plan. It just works as a way for the movie to you know, it's a it's a red herring sort of thing. The opening credits so this is crazy credits. The opening credits shown over Ichabod's travel to Sleepy Hollow interact with the landscape. If Ichabod's coach is near a river, the words are reflected on the surface of the water. If he's in a forest, the letters drift away like dead leaves, and so on. That's very nicely done. I really appreciate that someone wanted to... to I think this might be the one Hessian Horseman entry in the memorable quote section. And I'm just, I'm going to read aloud the, because, because I just, I, it's too good not to. Hessian Horseman, brackets, angry, all caps, yah, and they spelled it with the Y-A, three H's, and then had an apostrophe at the end. I, I, wait, apostrophe, sorry. Exclamation point, not apostrophe, sorry. I just, I appreciate that they added angry in brackets and that they tried to spell out the, the yars. It's too bad that it doesn't also say his only line or repeated line or something. And I, I like that someone did note, repeated line, Ichabod Crane, I see. Now, yeah, so in the in the Wikipedia, it says Christina Ricci described her character as a princess e character, very one-sided, no emotional depth, and that is kind of true. And it really it is a waste of a great actress. You know the the I guess. I'm sure there are people who are fed up with me talking about Monster because I cannot contain my praise of that movie to the videos I made specifically on the movie, but I'm just briefly going to say that in that movie, Christina Ricci shows that she can, she's capable of much more range than this character is given. So yeah, the, the, yeah, this is also Wikipedia. The set design was influenced by American colonial architecture, German expressionism, Dr. Seuss illustrations, and Hammer's Dracula has written, risen, sorry, risen from the grave. He did not write from the grave because, you know, how would he get the writing sent out? It would, it would only, he would only be able to read it himself. 
and that just gets annoying after a while. So I do think that would be a really I'd I'd like to know what Dracula's thoughts are on on the modern world. But yeah, Dr. Seuss and German expressionism, that's yeah. One soundstage, uh, ah, leaves them. I'm gonna go with that. Was dedicated to the forest to field set for the scene in which the headless horseman races out of the woods and into a field. The stage was then transformed into variously a graveyard, a cornfield, a field of harvest wheat, a churchyard, and a snowy battlefield. In addition, a small backlot area was devoted to a New York City street and waterfront tank. I am skimming through to see if there are more things that I would bring up. Nope, that was everything that I had noted to make sure to say. I think I have said everything that I wanted to make absolutely certain to say in this video. So I am... Yeah, I think I will, in closing, just briefly show you the cover. Because if you, you know, I understand that there are certain benefits to streaming, but I do find that it is, I, I quite like when to start a movie, you have to look directly at the cover and, and really take in. I realize there's also, you know, a cover when you click into, but... I don't know. To me, it's just some. I'm I'm old fashioned in some ways. So this is what the cover looks like on on my release. I think there are others, but yeah. You know, you've got the horseman down here approaching with an axe drawn, and yeah. I love the I love the font on on the Sleepy Hollow title. And I'm not usually a font person. In some cases, I'm fond of fonts. I hope you enjoyed watching, as I enjoyed watching the recording. Happy Halloween. Be safe out there. In fact, maybe just in case, be safe at home and, you know, celebrate Halloween as best you can from home. And I'll catch you next time.